So for section 3.5, we're going to expand our knowledge of higher degree polynomials. Uh, the good news is, if you know things about the basic polynomials, then you already know a lot um, about odd, odd degree polynomials and even degree polynomials. For instance, and um, if you need to pause this and kind of sketch it out, so we can, we're basically just going to talk through some of the rules, um, then we're going to apply them, okay? So when I have a higher degree polynomial, like uh, x to the first obviously isn't very high, but that's an odd degree. Well, it, this is talking about its beginning and ending behavior here, okay? When it's an odd degree, the beginning and ending behavior is always opposite. Look at a line. X to the first starts down here, ends up here. X to the third starts at the bottom left, ends on the top right. They're always going to opposite regions, bottom left, top right. If any of these had a negative in front of them, they would still be on opposite. If the A was negative, then this behavior would not be on the top, and this behavior would not be on the bottom. But they always go to opposite sides. Uh, they end on the bottom, start on the top, or they end on the start on the. Um, I just think I said that wrong. They either begin on the bottom, end on the top, or they begin on the top, end on the bottom. Odd degrees always begin and end opposite of each other. So this is just talking about beginning and ending behavior. Okay. Uh, up to how many zeros? Well, the beauty of this is. If I have x to the first, the degree tells me, the highest degree tells me how many zeros there can be. x to the first only has one zero. x to the third has up to three zeros. This looks like only one, but keep in mind that x to the third could also look like this. I'm going to talk about that later. But notice the beginning and the ending behavior stays the same. We have up to three zeros with an x to the third. Does that mean we always have three? No. If it was just like this, a perfect x cubed, it would only have one zero, but it can have up to three zeros. And x to the fifth, once again, looking at the power, it has up to five zeros. Doesn't mean it has five, but it has up to five zeros. Okay? If it's an even degree function, well then what that means is that the ending, the beginning and ending behavior are the same. Um, the x squared starts going up, it ends going up. X to the fourth starts going up, begins going up, ends going up. The beginning and ending behavior for all even degree functions stays the same. The beginning and ending behavior stays the same on any even degree function. X to the tenth will start up and end at the end up. Some weird stuff in the middle, but we're just talking about beginning and ending. Unless the A is negative. If the A is negative, what that does is it creates a reflection, so it begins down and it ends going down. But for an even degree function, the beginning and the ending behavior will be the same. Up to how many zeros? We said look at the degree. An x squared can have up to two zeros. The way I've drawn it, it only has one. But keep in mind that it could go below and give us up to two. Okay. So this picture shows us beginning and ending behavior. Um, this down here says x to the fourth could have up to four zeros. x to the sixth could have up to six zeros. x to the twentieth would have this same beginning and ending behavior with up to 20 zeros, okay? What else? Well, let's talk about the zeros specifically. So let's talk, let's still, if I have ax to the third plus bx squared plus cx plus d, that would be an x cubed, okay? We already said you can have up to three zeros. Does that mean you have to have three? No. You could have three zeros here. That's where it comes up. One, two, three. One zero second zero, third zero. What if we only had two zeros? Well, it could go through and hit a zero here, hits that highest point, comes back down, and stops. If it stops right on the x-axis, that only creates one more zero. We call that root a double root. See down here, each time it crossed through with a single point, so that would be a single root. One, two, three roots. If it had point where it comes down and it barely touches and run away. And I always think about like uh, when you're little kids and you're playing tag, right? You come up and you barely touch them and then you run away. That's basically all this does. It just barely taps it right there and then it runs away and creates a double root. Um, you could also have one real root right here. And then you could have this too where it comes down, but it never actually touches. That creates two imaginary roots. Okay, you will have, you for sure will have at least one zero. You have to have a zero on any odd function because beginning and ending behavior, probably should write this down, any odd function has at least one root. So if I have x to the n, 
where n is odd, it will have at least one root, okay? At most, n roots. So when x to the first has up to one, x to the third has up to three, x to the fifth has up to five, okay? But it will always, with an odd function, we have to have at least one. Why? Because of that beginning and ending behavior, at some point it has to cross the axis at least one time. As I scoot this down, what if I was dealing with an even function? I'm going to kick it up with like an x to the sixth. What if it has six roots? Well, that means, remember, it can have up to six, right? Well, that means that it crosses through one, two, three, four, five, six times. What if it had five? Well, that means that one of those roots had to become a double root because we're still going to have those six terms. So what that does is take those same, I'm going to draw the same one, two, three, go down four, but then when it goes down to this last two, we get a double root where it hits the axis and then runs away. Notice it now only crosses one, two, three, four, five times. So I can have five roots. One of them is a double root. Okay? There's lots of options. I'm not going to go through all of them, but everything we're doing here should make sense. Each time we cross through, it creates a root or a zero. If it goes down and bounces off, that's called a double root. Okay? Uh, the other thing we haven't talked about, which we'll be doing um, in our practice, will be local mins and max. See, here, this graph goes up forever, goes down forever. But what we do is we get these peaks and these valleys locally in the middle of the graph. What we do is we call those local maxes and local mins. Are they the actual max? No, they might be. Not in the not for an odd root. An odd root will always go from negative infinity to infinity. But we end up with local high points and local low points. We call those local max, local min, or we call those um, local extrema. So local extreme points, okay? Versus an even function, what we can do is we can have local min and local max, but you will always have uh, one of the local mins or one of the local maxes, depending on the direction, will be the actual min or the actual max. Why? Because of the ending beginning and ending behavior, okay? You will either always go up on both sides or it will go down on both sides. But the idea is that one of the min or the max is going to be infinity or negative infinity, depending on whether it opens up or down. Uh, one of the local max or local min will be the actual max or min. Okay? So once again, each of these peaks gives us a local min and a local max. Okay? What if we have four roots? Okay? Remember, this is to the six, and there should be like six terms. So, you know, one term. Two, there's two. Now what's going to happen here is I've only got one, two, three, four. I'm not done. That's next to the fourth. I need two more terms. Okay? So what that does is if it goes one, two, three, four, the last one needs to come down and become an imaginary. Those two, this would have been two more intercepts that we would have had. Now we have kind of a, a, like a double root, but a double imaginary root. Okay? Four real roots, one, two, three, four. These two, these last two solutions are imaginary because it never actually crosses the axis. Four roots, I could have two doubles. So not, this isn't our only option, but this could be one, two, three, four, and then single roots in the middle, five, six. Okay, double roots, basically another way of thinking about it is it acts like a parabola on a double root. It comes down and bounces off. Single roots go through, if you zoom in, they actually go through kind of like a straight line at that point. Obviously, there's a little bit of curving, but if we were to zoom in, it would look like a straight line, a single line going through there, okay? So double roots act like parabolas. Single roots act like straight lines at those zeros. Local extrema would be local max, local min. You could have multiple local maxes, multiple local mins. And then we'll have um, the actual max and min, which we should be able to read from the graphs. One more thing before we do some practice. Um, if we can have single roots, this is a single root. Why is this a single root? 
Well, at this point, if I zoom in, it's acting like a line, like an X to the first. If it acts like a line, at the root, then it is a single root. If it acts like a parabola, this is a parabola, it's opening downward, but it bounces off, that is a double root. If it acts like an x squared at that point. What's this back here? You're like, well, it looks like a line. Well, actually, look, I was kind of curving, and it curves to the left, and then bounces back up. If you get that little curvature in there, you can have a triple root. What is a triple shoot? A triple root acting like it acts like an x cubed at that point. Okay. You can also have four fit three roots because it mostly act just kind of like these. But a single root acts like a line, a double root bounces off, and a triple basically does this called cubic. It looks like a, an X to the third in that region. How many roots does this have? Well, one, two, three roots in total. One of them is triple, one of them is double, and one of them is single. If I add up all that, that still ends up being X to the three, four, five, six. This is still an X to the sixth function. It has one, two, three roots, one that's a triple, one that's a double, one that's a single. 3 plus 2 plus 1, 6 degree function. Okay? How do we apply this? Well, we're going to be using a lot with our technology. A lot of these are going to be reading graphs. It's really just introducing higher degree functions. Um, I've already typed these into my calculator, so you should um, feel free to pause it and type them in. But this is kind of what the graph should look like in this zoomed region. And then they're going to have a zoom in to find um, extreme points. Okay, so um, let me switch to my calculator here. This should be our first equation. Now, this actually looks a little better than the one that they had. I can see kind of a local max and min, versus if you're on T83, it looks a lot more like they did on that screen. Um, but I can see that it kind of goes up and then back down and then back up. It creates a local max and a local min. How would I zoom? Probably the easiest option. Um, I can drag this around and kind of get where I want it. But the easiest option to zoom in on here is to do a zoom box. Then what I can do is I can choose and kind of box in. This is really the region I'm interested in looking at. And it shows a lot of that curvature a lot more. And I can zoom in even further if I wanted to. The idea is what? I can see now that it reaches a max, goes back down to a minimum. I'm gonna have to redo that just so we can control Z, control Z. Control Z takes us back to the beginning, okay? So if I want to zoom into a region, menu, zoom, and I say box. What I do is I'm going to basically box in the area of the graph I want to look at. What does that do for me now? Well, then I can analyze any maximums. Choose a little before, choose a little after. It goes, oh my goodness, there's a max right there. Is that the maximum of the graph? No. But at 2.3 or 2, it reaches 3.67. So at 2, it reaches 3.67. That we would call a local max. Is it the actual maximum? No. What it is, is at that point right there, it reaches a highest point and goes back down. The actual max goes off forever, goes up forever. Okay. Local min. Same thing. Move this point over here. Menu, analyze graph, minimum. Choose a little before, choose a little after. It says, hey, there's a minimum at 3, comma 3.5. Is that the actual minimum? No. But we believe that at 3, comma 3.5, there is a local min. Let's try this again. This looks like an X cubed. But it looks like it just kind of stops. So look, this shows a little bit of a dip down here. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe there is a min there. Right? So let's see what happens. I already typed it in, so go ahead and take a second and type it in. By the way, this does not look like the one there, because what does the one there have a window from negative 10 to 10 and up to 20? So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Now that I've typed it in, I want this to go from negative 10 to 10 and from 0 up to 20. So menu, zoom, I'm going to choose the window settings this time. Negative 10 to 10 is fine on the X. The Ys on the one that they had went from 0 to 20. 
Now this should match closer to the picture that we see. I can see a little bit of a blip down, a little bit, but I want to zoom in to really see that curve there. So what do we do? Menu, zoom, I like box. And I can just kind of box in this region that I'm interested in. Helps me see that little dip down, that little dip up. If I want to zoom in further, I can. I'm good enough with that, so I'm going to hit escape. We need local, min, local, max. Menu, analyze, start with the minimum. Menu, analyze, maximum. So negative 5 and negative 4. Negative 5, 9.5. was a local min, negative 4, comma, 9.67, was a local max, local lowest point, local highest point. So I'm going to allow these, so I'm going to keep going. Feel free to pause if you need to. Type this into our calculator. I've already done that. I found the third one. Okay. This should look just like the one did. Once again, I can see where it dips down, dips up a little bit. T83, 84, a little harder to see. What are we going to do? Zoom into the window or box. Here's another option if you don't like that, the box, or if that's annoying to you. You can do to zoom um, in. I think that'll do it. Let me look. Yeah. And I think it'll let you choose. I can click here where I want to center in on. So it starts zooming in to whatever I want it to, that was too far. But the idea is what? I can actually just zoom in and just keep clicking, Control Z, and keep clicking, and it'll zoom in centered on whatever I want it to zoom in on. I like the box, because I like how it frames it in, but choices. Menu, Analyze, Local Minimum, choose before, choose after. Grab that point. Menu, analyze, maximum, choose before, choose after. I got a max and a min. Negative four, negative two. And what was the other one? Negative three and a third, or negative 3.33. And the Y was negative 1.85. This would be a local min. This would be a local max. One more. Uh, once again, type in the equation. It's a standard zoom, so it should look like that. Go over 1.4. I've already got it typed in. This should be what it looks like. Where is my local min, my local max? Right on that little curve right there. So I'm going to zoom in with a box. You can choose the center and do it that way. I like the box. Now I can see. And see, it's a little harder to see the curve there, so you could actually zoom in a little further, and that shows a little bit more. A little bit more. That creates a little bit. It still just looks, man, really flat. How do I check it? Well, I can analyze the graph and go, is there a local max somewhere between here and here? Notice if I keep going, it's like way over here. There are higher points, so I need to stay in that curve where I get my local max. Over here, the max goes on forever. I have to stay in that curve to get my local max. To get the local min, analyze a minimum, I need to stay in that curve here. Because if I go to the left, it goes left, the minimum keeps going down. I need to stay where I believe the local min is. So my local max is 0 0.5, 3.33. Local max. The min was what? Point six. And I can't read that. 3.32. Dang, that's close. 3.32. So your eye is going to be deceiving. It doesn't really look like it made much of a difference. The x just changed by point 0.1, and that reaches the highest point and the lowest point locally in that region. Okay. The other thing we'll analyze are zeros. And we've done this before, but um, I should probably write that one. That was a local 
min. The other thing we can analyze is zeros. Once again, I've got these already typed in, so feel free to pause the lecture and type them in. Um, but this looks like it has that one little zero right there, right? Well, could we see if there's more than one? Well, let's zoom in on it. So our next equation here, here's the equation. And notice, man, it looks like it just bleeps right there, just one little zero, right? So what if we were to zoom in on that region? So zoom box again, and I want to focus just kind of on that region right there. Still looks like it only crosses once. So let's zoom in a little bit closer. Still looks maybe a little bleep below. So I'm going to try this one more time. I'm going to keep the vertical a little more different here. But look, now I can kind of see that the line goes below. It goes below. So it's hard to see. Somewhere in here, I can see that it hits there, goes a little below, and a little bit back up. I'm going to even back it up because I don't have to zoom it in that far. But at one point, I go, wait a second. It crosses this twice. I know an x squared has up to 2. It looked like it only crossed once. Can we be sure? Well, analyze graph. Maybe. This time we're looking for zeros. If I go below and I go after, what will happen is, is it only gives me one. So I have to stop, menu, analyze graph, for another zero. After that one, gives me both of them now. So I see there are not just one zero. There's one at 2.1 and 2.15. So we have a 0 at 2.1 and we have a 0 at 2.15. Up to two zeros, this one has two. Same here, looks like it only crosses once, right? Type that equation in and let's zoom in and see how it works. Typed it in looks like it, I can almost see the line kind of go below. Zoom. I like the box. That one's a little easier to see. I see it goes below right there. If you want to zoom in a little further, you can. But the idea is that what? I can see the line dips below right there. So what can I do now? Analyze the zeros. Oh, there's more than one. There's one there. There's one there. One here. One here. Grab the first one, menu, analyze, zero, go here, and grab the second one. So negative 3.55 and negative 3.4. And negative 3.4. Let's keep going. Two more. This x squared is negative, so it opens downward. So it's talking beginning and ending behavior here, okay? Um, it looks like it only crosses there once. Well, let's see. Type that in. Or with the brown equation. Almost looks like it doesn't even touch at all. I don't know. Zoom. Box. Hmm. I'm looking for a zero here. What happened? See, now that I zoom in, it doesn't even look like it crosses there, does it? Menu, analyze. We thought there was a zero right there. But if I look lower and above, it's not picking anything up. What does that mean? There is no zero in this graph. It looks like it reaches, but it never quite gets close enough. This I could grab the max just to show you. That's the highest point. What does that mean? It never reaches zero, does it? It gets really close, 0 0.037. So in the picture, it looks like it has a zero. That doesn't mean it's a zero. This one actually has no zeros, no x-intercepts. What does that mean? Well, that's two imaginary intercepts. This one, uh, probably going to do the same thing. Looks like it crosses there. Let's see. Type that equation in. Oh, this one blatantly on my picture, I can see it doesn't quite reach to zero. Analyze. Uh, I was going to zoom in. Zoom. Box. That's a little clearer. You can go like, yes, this ain't crossing, right? This isn't hitting anywhere close to zero. Well, now it doesn't look like it's getting anywhere close to zero. I'm not going to be able to if I try to analyze the graph and find a zero. There are no zeros. In this region, 
This graph has no zeros. This graph doesn't have any zeros. I can find what? I could find the local max. But notice that never reaches zero, does it? So this graph has what? No zeros, no x-intercepts there. It would have no real, I guess no real would be the key word here, real x, no real x-intercepts. Okay? It's an E. All right. So um, that's it. That should be enough to kind of get you through the homework. But focusing mostly on beginning behavior, ending behavior, local max, local min, and then actual max and actual min. Um, not too hard of a section. I know it's been a little overwhelming because we just took a test today, but uh, muscle through it. We'll have a quiz on this tomorrow. We're actually going to finish Chapter 3 tomorrow. So keep up the hard work. Uh, you're doing really well.